chapter number two tonight. Uh, this week, a year ago, we, well, let's start back three years ago. My wife and I, through prayer and uh, the Lord's leading, moved to South Central Pennsylvania. We have been praying about it for some time. And we finally said, God knows this is where we need to be. And God's got some things planned. We didn't know the direction he was taking us. Uh, it's certainly taken different turns along the way, but three years ago, we finally said, okay, we're going to go. And three years ago, uh, there was a church that was not a Baptist church, that was not preaching the gospel, that began remodeling a building and put about $70,000 into this building so that three years later, our church could go on a Friday and sign papers on it, and I can tell you all the miracle stories about it, but we were able to pay cash for the building. Um, that's, that'd be my whole 20 minutes of preaching, so we're not going to go into that tonight. But, um, but it's just interesting to see, that's my Abraham moment of when we finally said, okay, God, we're going to go, that God started remodeling a church that we now own for our church. Uh, it was actually this week, a year ago, that we voted on being a church and being Bible Baptist Church, not the one that Mrs. Borton's from, but a different one. Uh, so we're well represented tonight, but we're excited of what God's doing. Uh, we're about three and a half, four weeks into a building project to add about 24 feet to the front of the building so we can get our bus ministry going again, uh, as well as have a prophet's chamber and office. So we're thrilled at what God's doing. Uh, I cannot say thank you to the Lord for the people that we have to work with. Uh, we're blessed uh, with a tremendous group of people, and it's all a testimony of what you guys have done here, uh, and we thank you so much for your faithfulness. Acts chapter number 2, uh, we're going to get to verse number 41 here in just a minute, uh, but verse number 7 of the same chapter says, And they were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? Verse number 12 of, that saint, of chapter 2. And they were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, What meaneth this? I, we sit here at the conclusion of this celebration, really, for 50 years of Fairhaven Baptist Church. And I myself stand and say we're amazed at what God has done. We're blessed at what God has done. What wonderful things have taken place right here over 50 years. I want to look at this passage in verse number 41. We're going to read down through verse 47. And stop as we read through this and think. I'm not going to stop. I'm going to keep on going. But stop and look at some of the things that took place. We know this as the day of Pentecost. A lot of these things that were mentioned in this passage are very similar to what happened here at Fairhaven Baptist Church. Not necessarily a one-day thing, but a, over 50 years. Verse number 41 says, Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. And they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Sound like a church, like Fairhaven Baptist Church. And fear came upon every, every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. And all that believed were together and had all things common, and sold their possessions and goods and parted to all men as every man had need. Sound like a ministry like this one. And they, continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. This passage, I look at what happened here on Pentecost, and I think to myself as I began reading this and looking at this for this message tonight, I began to tell myself, say to myself, let's do this again. Then the Lord stopped me and he said, no, if we leave it at let us do it again, it will not happen. So I've changed it to Lord, do this again. Lord, do this again. Fifty more years. You say, maybe the Lord will come back. That's okay. But may the Lord find this place doing exactly what it's done for 50 years. 
Let's look at this this evening of what happened at Pentecost. You say, many times we like to jump up and, and we look forward to championship day. We look forward to hosting the trophy because we won. And that's what this day was. It was the trophy day for the time that was put into it. But when I think of what, what the apostles and what the church put in preparing for the day of Pentecost, it took me back to a couple years ago in high school basketball. It was, uh, I don't remember what year I was in high school, but it was the first game of the year, Marquette Manor up in Downers Grove, Illinois. I remember that because for me, first game, dressing out, it was kind of like a playing for the home crowd because that was our candy sale territory. <laughs> so I got, we got up there, got all dressed up. I went out to the, to the court, sat the bench for the first quarter, End of the first quarter, zero points, zero rebounds, zero minutes played. Came back to halftime, same thing. Mr. Armacost was, Coach Armacost was re ready to fit to be tied, like he was many times with us. Third quarter, same thing. Fourth quarter, we finished up, zero points, zero rebounds, zero minutes played. And I remember him coming back in, and I remember the number to this day, 21% shooting that day for the team. You say, well, what does that mean? That means not even one out of every four shots were made. So I don't know if it was something that I had to do, but I never dressed for a varsity basketball game again. But that was okay because a couple games later, we were up at Ridgeview, and our team grandmother, Mrs. Richardson, was there with her chocolate chip cookies. And you can see I didn't dress out. I ate chocolate chip cookies <laughs> the rest of my career. But we were sitting up there, and the same thing happened. We were not making baskets. And I can remember one by one, he began to pull the starters out, and they were sitting on the bench. I don't know if he remembers this. They were saying, he had them the rest of the game say, make a layup, make a layup, make a layup. And I remember hearing him turn and say, I can't hear you, say it louder. All the starters for the team. We got back to the, 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 the facility here, the gym, and you can imagine the next day, what did we do in practice? Do you think he sat us down and pulled the clipboard out and said, we didn't shoot well last night, so let's draw up a trick play to, to fake them out? No. We went back to dribbling the basketball and shooting a layup. We, everything we did that day, we were saying, make a layup, make a layup. We, every scenario... From picking the ball up off the ground to shooting a layup. From sitting on the ground to shooting a layup. What was he doing for us? Taking us back to the basics, to the fundamentals. And when I look at a place like this, I think to myself, it's not time to draw up a trick play. We don't need to trick the world to come into a church like this Stick to the old-fashioned gospel and the, let the Lord do the rest. We don't need to change the music to what it sounds like in their daily life so that they'll come hear us in church and feed the gospel a little bit to them. Keep the music what it is. Keep the version of the Bible what it is. Keep the dress standards what it is. We're not tricking them to come to church. We're just giving them the gospel to, when they come to church. And so that's what I want to look at just briefly tonight is what did these people that were at Pentecost do? Three simple things, basic things that will help us when we say, Lord, do this again. Dear Heavenly Father, we plead for your Holy Spirit's filling in this message tonight. We thank you for speaking to our hearts already today. And we just ask for your Holy Spirit. Lord, I pray that you'll give me the words to say. Help me to say nothing more and nothing less than I should. Lord, I pray that you'll empty us of distractions that are outside these walls. And allow us to focus on what you have for us. In your name we pray. Amen. The first thing that I see that these people that were involved with Pentecost is in chapter number one. I'm going to cut some of these verses down a little bit, but chapter number one, verse 13 through 15, if you're writing the numbers down, the first thing that these people did was they prayed. You say, that's basic. Absolutely. 
The Bible says these all continued with one, with one accord in prayer and supplication. Who? All the apostles, the leaders. But it doesn't stop there. It says with the women and Mary the mother of Jesus and his brethren. And it goes on to say that in that upper room for about 10 days before Pentecost, I don't know the time that they spent up there, but they spent time in one accord praying and asking God to do a special work. If we're going to see this church do it again, we must plead that God do it through prayer. And what amazes me when I was thinking of this verse just today, it says with one accord. I don't think if they just off the cuff got together and said, let's go spend 10 days in prayer and had not been doing it before that they would have seen God answer the prayer. I think these people were given to prayer before this time. What, are you tr what am I trying to say? Thursday night prayer meeting's good. Saturday night men's prayer meeting's good. Cottage prayer meetings are good. But that's not good enough. It has to be a single person. Every person here must be on their knees asking God to do it again. If I don't do it again, if I'm not on my knees asking God to do it again, God won't do it for me. He might continue the church, but I won't be a part of it. I must be in prayer. It's not the program that's going to keep this place going. It's the prayer. It's not the trick play, but the trust in God's hand upon this place. Don't rely on your pastor to be a prayer warrior, and he should be. Don't rely on everybody else to be in prayer. You ought to be in prayer. I believe it's the Apostle James that they said when he was taken to be martyred, he had calluses on his knees because of the time he had spent on his knees praying to God. We must be a church of prayer. Well, even the disciples said, Teach us to pray. And I think they got a little bit of it because they learned it. And God did special things through that. Secondly, we see in Acts chapter 2, verse number 4, because they were praying, because they were in, the, uh, in one accord asking God to bless their church, their meeting that was going to take place, they were pleading for the Holy Spirit to come. Because of that... They were all, what's it say? And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. What do I mean by filled with the power of the Holy Ghost? A couple weeks ago, we preached a very simple message on who was the man in the chariot coming to Philip, the Ethiopian eunuch. And I just went simply and said he was an unsaved man. He was an unsettled man. And we went through a few things. And at the invitation, the first note, a man came down to the front that had been in the church for a few weeks, for a few months. And he stood right up front. He didn't care who was watching. And he said, I need to be saved. I'm unsettled. And I need Jesus. And you say, well, that must have been a powerful sermon. No, no, no. It was because the night before there was some men on their knees, pouring their heart out to God, saying there's someone in our congregation that does not know Jesus Christ as their Savior. That's what it was. It was men that were gathered praying for God to do something. The Bible tells us we need to have power to preach. You say, I'm not a preacher. Go ye into all the world and preach the gospel. Every one of us must have power to proclaim the gospel. Every one of us must have power to preach the, preach the word of God. If this church is going to go forward, this must continue to be a, a, a pulpit that the power of God is preached behind. I tell my people there's two things. There must be strong preaching for a church to continue. The second thing goes with the next part of power is power to progress. There can be strong preaching here, but if there's not power in the seats from the Holy Spirit, it's not going to go anywhere. 
The Word of God does sometimes fall on stony ground. And I tell my people, if these steps are not soaked with tears of people that have a desire to progress to what God wants them to do, that repent of their sin, this church will not go on for another 50 years. We must have the power of God on our, in our church. How do we see that? This book of the law shall not depart out of my mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and, day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous. We want it, Lord, do this again. We must be in the Word. We must have power in the Word. We saw we must have prayer, we must have power, but the last thing, and I think this is the most important thing, go to go, uh, uh, Acts chapter 2, verse number 17. And it will come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my Spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions. If this place is going to continue... We must pass it on. We must pass it on. It's good for Pastor Dameron. But if it doesn't go to his kids, it's not going to be good enough. It's good for Brother Ramus. But it's got to go to his son. We see it in the, in the generations of the church. But what happens when we leave one generation out... What happens? I have 0 to 10 year olds in my church. I have 10 to 20 year olds. I have 30 to 40, 40 to 50, 50 to 60, 60 to 70, 70 to 80, and 80 to 90. We stop at 86. But there's one, one group I don't have. 20 to 30. And I told my people this. I said, you know why? Because somebody didn't teach their next generation. And some of those people are sitting in my church, and I'm not doing it to hurt them. I'm doing it because this, if that gap gets any bigger, that church will cease to exist. And it's our duty to pass it on. You say, well, I don't have any kids. I have a nine-year-old boy in my church right now that says he wants to be a song leader. You know why? Because a 77-year-old guy that's leading my song says, I can't do it forever. And he singled out this boy and found his favorite song. And every time we sing it, the boy's doing this. Why? Because somebody says, I need to pass it on. What's he say in Acts chapter 2, verse 39? Or uh, uh, 40. For the promise is unto you... And to your, and to your, there we go. What promise? The promise that you repent and get saved, you get baptized, and you can receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. My kids need to know that I'm filled with the Holy Spirit, but my kids need to know how to get it for themselves. They can't ride my coattails forever because I'm not going to be here forever. And my legacy is not how good it is when I'm here. It's what I've left when I'm gone that can continue to serve the Lord. Don't stop working for yourself. Pray for the future. Prepare for the future. Look to the church uh, look at the church for when you're gone. Look at the ministries you're in. If you pass away, will that ministry continue? You say, yeah, Fairhaven will fill, will fill it. Maybe God wants you to help fill it by training somebody that's younger than you. If we don't pass it on, this will cease to exist. 2 Timothy 2.2, 2, And the things that thou hast heard of me among many witnesses, the same commit thou to faithful men, who shall be able to teach others also. We need that next generation to be those faithful men. 
the time stamp as I conclude, the time stamp of Fairhaven Baptist Church in the time of eternity does not amount to anything. But the fruit of the church will. Whether the church stops at the 50th anniversary or the 100th anniversary, or until the Lord comes back, the only thing that matters is that God's power is on this place. There's a church in McConnellsburg. It's called the Bethel Saito AME Church, African Methodist Episcopal Church. 2019, they celebrated their 115th anniversary. Tremendous, right? You know what that 115 meant? That they only had to charge $15 for their crab fest when you came. You only, only $15 because it worked with 115. They were going to have a great wine tasting time. And Sunday afternoon at 4 o'clock was going to be the best basketball of the area because they had a tournament. And squeezed in there for a little bit was going to be a little service to make it spiritual. You know what happened? It got to a point where their anniversary, their celebration was just that, a celebration. And no longer the power of God was on it. And I look at Fairhaven Baptist Church. And I say if this 50th celebration is just a celebration... It's not what it's supposed to be. In two weeks, we celebrate our first anniversary. And I've told my people, may it not just be a celebration. A rejoicing, yes, of what God's done and a blessing of what God's done. But may it be us getting on our knees and saying, God, do this again. May it be us getting on our knees and saying, God, we need your power. And when we leave that anniversary Sunday, may it be us getting somebody to pass it on to. That's what we need. I conclude with this as we go to the invitation. We mentioned it just briefly there in in, in, uh, uh, chapter 2, verse 39, when Peter said, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. There's one thing that must also take place, and that's people coming to know Christ as their Savior. If you've never come to Jesus Christ and repented of your sin, and put those sins under the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, you do not have remission of sin. And someday every one of us will stand before God Almighty, and He will look at the sins that we've committed on this earth and say, what do you have to answer for your sins? And if you've not put them under the blood of Jesus Christ, you'll say, I I have nothing. If you have, you can hold out your hand and say, I have the blood of Jesus Christ. And it washed my sin away. So the call to you is, if you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, you come today. We'll be more than happy, more than glad, excited. Young person, this is part of passing it on. If you've not accepted Christ, that's the first thing. Then we can do the rest of the steps. But as a church, I challenge you, you're a testimony to us at one year that it can be done. But I pray that at 50 years, we can look here and say this is 100 years. Because we say, Lord, you do it again. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for these truths. Lord, as we come to the invitation, I pray that this will be something that we know. I know it was from you. I know you gave it to me. I pray that it will be a challenge to us. I pray, Lord, that if there's anyone that's not ever not accepted you as their Savior, Lord, that today would be the day of salvation. And Lord, as we close this week out, I ask that it'll be a time that we're challenged to do it again through your power and your strength. That we'll be people of prayer, people of power, and we'll be willing to pass it on to the next generation. 
as the instrument play, as we come to the invitation, I'm going to ask that you stand with your heads bowed, eyes closed. <clears throat>